Hello, and welcome to Crafting a Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I'm one of your hosts. Every week, we bring you interviews with makers of all kinds from all over the world, those that identify as female or non-binary or trans. Today's guest is Rogelio Rendon, um, and Rogelio is a non-binary maker that does wood carving, furniture making, and all sorts of other woodworking. Perhaps the deepest love, though, is for carving characters that are influenced by Native American and Japanese cultures, in addition to Rogelio's lived experiences. In addition to carving characters for themselves, for themselves and occasionally selling their work, Rogelio also works for a furniture maker in the San Diego area. Um, it was a great pleasure uh, to get to talk to Rogelio and learn about their um, kind of process for carving and, <clears throat> and what uh, draws them to that type of work. And if you are not following them, I should say their um, Instagram channel is Crooked Craftwork, and you can go see their amazing little characters. I just love them to death. Before hopping into the conversation, though, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So thank you so much. Matthew from Artigiano Serio. Um, Matthew is one of the podcast sponsors. So thank you so very much for really supporting the podcast. And thank you, Candice, CJ Woodgrain, Lee at Lee Runyon, Annette 513 Woodworks, Katie Thompson, Women of Woodworking, Kevin Lefty's Woodshop, Christy Twisted Twine, Jeremy Spies, Sammy Go Sammy Lee, Rachel Moody Makes, Bonnie Tool Mom Bonnie, toolmomstore.com, Laura Oakley Soap Company, Brandy Studio Obey, Lee the Rainbow Carver, Ellen Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much for your continued and ongoing support helping to produce the podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to help support it as well, please stick around to the end of the episode and find out how. And uh, with no further ado, let's hop on into the conversation with Rogelio Rendon of Crooked Craftworks. Um, good. All, all right. Well, I like to start by asking my guests to introduce themselves. Would you do that for me? For sure. So my name is Rogelio Rendon. I'm a wood carver furniture maker, all around woodworker, dabbling in some metal work. Um, I'm a non-binary maker, so pronouns they, them, but you know, I won't jump at you for getting it wrong, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and thank you for um, giving me your pronouns. That was gonna be my next question, so I appreciate mm -hmm. that. No problem. Uh -huh. So I kind of want to, get started with just like a pretty broad question which is like what's kind of what's your story what's your creative story you know from when you were little to to now how'd you kind of get into all of this it's actually kind of a funny story um the beginning sounds a little irrelevant but it all ties back and it's pretty far back so it all started in like I would say the spring of 2008, you know, freshman year of high school, I was just on my way to the bus stop, ready to go home. <laughs> I got my iPod out and all of a sudden, and it's a pretty busy street. It just so happened to not be too busy today. So it was a perfect time for these people. Um, two guys just showed up right behind me, um, pulled out a knife and they were like, hey, give us your iPod or get beat up. And I'm like, I didn't even respond. They just uh, went ahead and grabbed the iPod and took off. And then I saw them do the same thing to another person across the street. So anyways, that happened. That same day, I told my brother, like, um, I don't know how to bring it up to him, but I was like, the, I just got jumped for my iPod. And obviously he was furious for a few days after that. He was walking me to the bus stop walking me home. Um, he decided that maybe it would be a good idea to give me something for self-defense, which was a little pocket knife. 
So it's kind of funny because I had to keep it in a Ziploc bag because I couldn't get in trouble for it. But <laughs> flash forward out of high school, still have that pocket knife. Now I have a job. And I noticed the pocket knife was like really old and rusty. And I thought it was about time. Like, hey, I should replace this knife, you know, find another nice one. I started looking for some knives on the internet, like an edgy child that I am. And I just stumbled across a wood carving knife and clicked on it from there on out. Just a bunch of wood carving tools started coming up. And I'm like, well, what the hell is wood carving? Like, so I looked it up and I thought it was pretty awesome. I wanted to, I didn't realize you could use a knife, something that I thought was so cool to already make, to make even more cool stuff. So I ended up buying a wood carving kit. Flash forward three years later, I didn't touch it till then. <laughs> um, and I started looking for inspiration on wood carvings. Um, couldn't get too into it with the character tutorials that I was finding, but I stumbled across these things called Gachina dolls, which were these wooden dolls that Native American Hopi and Navajo would carve. And I really got into that. And I saw that same with them. They just sort of use a little, like one knife a lot of the times to make these sculptures. And along with that, I also was checking out Japanese kokeshi dolls. I'm sure you've seen them, the tiny little geisha mm -hmm. doll. Yes, I absolutely love those. And I just love that they were these big headed characters with like no neck. And you'll see that a lot in my work. It's just these characters with enormous heads, but you know, no neck and a little stubby body. So it's kind of how I started wood carving. Just took off from there and got into bigger stuff. Most of the stuff that I make is like little four inches, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, whatever I can work with in my two hands. Um, the story can go on, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's where I started. In general. Oh. Yeah, it all started with getting jumped. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. That is, I will say that's probably the most interesting origin story I've ever heard for uh -huh. <laughs> getting into to woodworking. Mm -hmm. It was a terrifying experience, but I would say yeah. something great came out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you, um, where did you grow up? I grew up in San Diego. So was born here, raised here, grew up all my life here. You know, place too expensive to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're still in the San Diego area? Yes, I'm okay. still here. I, uh, I, le I lived for almost five years in Oceanside. So, um, Oh, really? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm familiar okay. So you're with, familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with the area. Um, so yes, yeah, horrible experience to get you started, but it took you down a pretty cool, <laughs> <laughs> a pretty cool route eventually. Um, that was bit. yeah. Is it, um, is it, or did it start as just a hobby? Is it still kind of just a hobby? It started as just a hobby, <clears throat> you know, just playing around with it. Then it started becoming this thing that I was doing all the time. And then literally all I can think of is like what to make next. And I still have that feeling in my, in the back of my head. Um, while the stuff that I make is pretty small and playful, you know, it's, I would say it's kind of more than a hobby. Mm -hmm. Like, I do love making toys, like making figurines. And that's, I definitely want to take that somewhere, whether it's in a larger scale, whether it's in a smaller scale. Um, the production is not too fast, so I can kind of say it's a hobby, but, you know, I, I, I would say it means more to me than it being just a hobby. Mm -hmm. yeah what did I, I mean I've I've watched makers like yourself making you know hand carving figurines and stuff and like I'm always just blown away by it because I enjoy carving but I think I've just been too scared to attempt like figurative work because I feel like you have mm -hmm. to be kind of 
almost perfect with it. Otherwise it doesn't, um, it just doesn't have the same effect, right? If it doesn't kind of come out just the way proportions and all of that stuff, like, did you, was it a steep learning curve or do you feel like you were kind of like a natural at it? I would say it was a steep learning curve when I was trying to carve what other people were carving, like going off of tutorials and it just wasn't working for me, like drawing the character on the piece of wood before you carve it or using these specific methods of getting started. I, I just call it the way I do it is potato peeling. Like okay. I grab a knife. I have some videos of it and I just start carving away like no drawing on the piece of wood just okay I'm gonna start just hacking away at it until I get around the shape that I want mm -hmm. so it's kind of abstract to a certain point and then once I see that it's kind of there you know I just start adding all the little details and that's where the character really comes out I, I'm gonna say it was a very steep learning curve because if I look back at all the things I've made, you know, it's all the poses were essentially these characters just standing up, like with their arms straight down, mm -hmm. you know, like in this little plank position. And I was doing that forever, like the same pose, just these characters standing straight, arms down. And it took me a while to really break into these different little orientations, like their arms sticking out legs spread apart so I'm barely starting that and I will call it a steep learning curve actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you see the the character in your head like before you even start carving do you see where you're trying to go with it definitely um like once I pick up the piece of wood like I, I feel like there's a little person in there that's you know, it's stuck and I got to help them get out of there. So, mm -hmm. you know, the moment my, the moment I make the first cut, like I already see the character, like it's in there. I just got to get it out. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you hope that this, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm assuming from your earlier answer, like this is not what you get to do full time. Um, do you hope that it is something you get to do full-time eventually? I would hope that it's something I get to do full-time, you know, for sure. Like, definitely, like, my partner calls it a Peter Pan complex. We're all Peter Pan. He wanted to do was be a kid forever. And, mm -hmm. well, for me, I just, I just want to make toys, like, all the time. Like, little figurines, you know, wherever I take it. I would, if I could get it to a place where I can do it full time, you know, I'll definitely run with that. Um, no matter what I do with it, whether it's, whether I have a day job and I just make these little creations on the side or whether I take it full time, I'm going to keep at it. Mm -hmm. um, well, most of the stuff that I make is with hand work. And I love that. Like, I love using hand tools. Mm -hmm you know it, it is a slow process so eventually potentially if I afford these tools that could speed up the process like I've been using some of the tools in the studio at SDSU practicing with the orbital sander mm -hmm. band uh, you know seeing how I could speed up the process without giving up the the thing that's special to me which is the handwork yeah you know, just speed it up and, you know, I, I would like to get it to a place where I can make a good earning off of it. Mm -hmm. So are you currently in school at SDSU then? Mm -hmm. I just graduated last semester. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm still there as a shop monitor. So just helping other okay. students get their projects done. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you still get access to an awesome shop. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> so I got the studio access there along with my day job, which is at a wood shop as well, making corbels there. You know, my boss doesn't mind that we stick around from time to time, you mm -hmm. know, work on our own things. Mm -hmm. that's so cool. 
I don't have my own shop, but I have some sort of access. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you, um, like, was it hard to find those type of, that type of work with access to a shop? Was it something that was important to you to find something like that? You mean like job-wise, like employment-wise? Yeah. yeah. It was definitely important. Like I did go to SDSU to major in furniture making. Mm -hmm. And I got really lucky with this job with J.L. Schroeder. That's his name, Jacques Lamont Schroeder. You know, Jacques, you spell it in the French way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Whatever that might mean to you. (laughs) Um, The moment I started looking for a job, I saw he had posted a job just 10 minutes after I started searching or before I started searching. <laughs> so I lucked out. I was the first person to apply. Um, yeah, it was definitely important for me to find a job in an environment like that, just to keep on learning, mm-hmm. even while I'm not in school. Um, I learned all of these amazing skills in school. Now I'm learning how to apply it kind of like in a production shop. And Jacques is a great teacher. Like he's constantly teaching more me more things. Like aside from having an employee, he's also concerned with like teaching us mm-hmm. like his methods. So it's a great experience for me, and it is what I wanted for sure. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Today's episode is sponsored by Athena Outfitters. Athena Outfitters is a quality workwear brand for hardworking women that sells everything badass beauties need to get the job done from work boots to basics. They curate the toughest essentials made to help you perform every piece is handpicked to seamlessly slide right into your daily lifestyle from rugged and roguish weekday wear to effortless weekend flair. You can fill your closet with gear that can do it all. So for Christmas, I ordered my wife like a very nice pair of slippers from Athena Outfitters and she loves them. Loves them so much that she has accidentally gone to the gym and the grocery store in them because they seem to never leave her feet. So definitely a place to go check out, go get the goods that help you not only out in the shop, but just in your daily uh, work around the house and outdoors. As a listener of the podcast, you can go to Athena Outfitters website and use coupon code M. M as in M&Ms, 15 for 15% off any purchase. So again, you go to athenaoutfitters.com and use the code MM15 and get 15% off of your purchase at checkout. And you said, so you you graduated with furniture uh, design as your degree? Yes. Awesome. Um is that the experience right now that you have with the larger pieces you were talking about um, is just through school so far and, and work? Larger pieces, like if we're talking about like structural, yeah, like furniture, yeah, that's the experience I have at the moment. Um, as far as larger pieces with wood carving goes, mm-hmm. um, the biggest I'm able to go up to you know, with the hand tools is, I think my tallest figurine is about 12 inches. So okay. yeah, it's the whole process. Mm-hmm. What kind of wood do you use for your um, figurines? I'm currently using basswood. It's okay. just the English. Yeah, yeah. Accessible wood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're doing your figurines, are you... Are you doing, is it all like commission work or are you just basically creating what you create? Like it's, it's driven by you. It's driven by me. Um, At some point I was doing commissions, but with the time that it takes, it can sometimes be hard, like, you know, putting in all the work to a piece you're making, but essentially someone else's idea. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. So every piece I make is really for myself, but at some point I sell it, mm-hmm. but it can be tough. Cause again, like, you know, everything I make, I make it for myself. Right. 
until I reached a point where like, okay, maybe I can make some money off of this. Okay. I actually really need money right now. So I'm, <laughs> I'm right. going to have to let go of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that just leads me to think like how many figurines are filling your home? I used to have a lot. Like I used to have my shelves, like in my old apartment living with my family I had my shelves filled with nothing but wood carvings so I would say easily over 20 over 30. Mm -hmm. um, right now since like I sold the whole little horror series of all the classic horror characters mm -hmm. I'm barely building it up again I'm about 13 14 figurines right now. Mm -hmm. Okay okay so small um, mm -hmm. yeah do you um paint your work or do you leave it all like just the raw wood I paint all of it so carve it put a finish on it like either Danish oil yep. linseed oil and then paint over it mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. why do you why do you put the finish on before the paint I'm curious it's this kind of a weird thing where everyone's constantly giving different advice on that yeah <laughs> like am i supposed to put a finish before i paint it and so many people will say yes you want to protect the wood but then i'll be asking individual wood carvers like do you put a finish on your work before you paint it and they're like no i just go ahead straight on there and paint it um a lot of the times it's easier to put a finish on it first because the wood does soak up a lot of the paint and you have to do a really cake on the layers. Mm. I did realize recently though that the downside of putting a finish on it is that it takes a lot longer to dry than you think. Like mm -hmm. it can be dried to the touch, but I painted a Grim Reaper whose robe was entirely black. It looked beautiful at first, but then the next day I started to see like oils starting to like and go through the paint so i'm gonna be honest i'm still figuring out the process of the painting like mm -hmm. whether i should be putting on a finish what kind of finish to use before i paint mm -hmm. or should i just go ahead and slap on the paint yeah <laughs> i could definitely see that the wood would would soak it up because it is just like any other <clears throat> would soak up the paint just like any other um finish right when you put that first like coat on it's almost like you didn't apply anything because it mm -hmm. just like soaks it all up the the basswood are you how are you sourcing that the basswood is off of ebay which yeah. is a great deal um much better than amazon or going to a craft store and mm -hmm. getting these irregular pieces ebay like you'll find a lot of sellers that I guess they're from places where there's a lot of basswood mm -hmm. and they cut them to specific size and sell you several in that specific size, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. you, usually I'm thinking in my head, like when I've seen basswood pieces at like, like you said, like a craft store, like Michael's they're they're not as big as like what you talked about of some of your bigger figurines. They're usually pretty small pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're tiny. Yeah. So yeah, if you ever need a decent sized piece of basswood, it's either eBay or here in San Diego, we have TH and H. Yep. So a gigantic slab, but I don't have my own bandsaw, so it's right. <laughs> all our deal. Yeah. Using a bandsaw. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and I could definitely see the benefits of like you having a bandsaw. Um, because mm -hmm. it would like you said, it would cut down the time of maybe getting to that first, like, kind of overall basic shape. Mm -hmm. And you could get into the details with the, the handwork. Yes. I mean, that's what a lot of, like, spoon carvers and stuff do, too, right? They, like, cut out the, the kind of rough shape on the bandsaw mm -hmm. and then finish it up um, all with hand tools. Oh, yeah, definitely. So bandsaw is great for sculpture. And at some point I was like, no, hand tools only. Hand tools is the way to go. 
you know, they're kind of in that Puritan mindset, which is yes. silly for the little things I'm making. But then I realized, like, no, I got to step out of that mindset. Like, mm-hmm. I got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's things to get done. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious um, and, you know, only share as much as you're comfortable with. But I am a little curious about how your uh, gender identity journey has intermixed with kind of the this creative side Hmm. well it isn't until some of my maybe recent pieces where I started including like the concept of sort of mental health some sort of isolation Mm -hmm. and I think I can sort of tie it back to those feelings of coming to terms with my gender identity Mm -hmm. my most recent pieces unapproachable where it's just this little figurine with a bunch of spikes jutting out kind of looking down and the sleeper which is I made a box and there's like a figurine sleeping Mm -hmm. the box is closed you see two holes you get a peek of the figurine sleeping peacefully but then you open up the box and it's just this sort of nightmarish world Mm -hmm. kind of thinking like oh maybe you know It's this sort of mental health thing. I would say like potentially indirectly, I tied that to sort of feelings of, you know, how it could feel for me sometimes like being in this sort of isolation Mm -hmm. mindset with the whole gender identity. As far as intermixing it into my work goes, I'm pretty new to that I just got those two pieces and I'm lucky enough to have gotten into a job where you know it's not an issue Mm -hmm. you know the whole non-binary thing it's just five of us and you know everyone's cool with it um yeah I was I was gonna ask that because I I mean I I am fully aware that there are many wood shop spaces that are, you know, borderline toxic max masculinity. Mm-hmm. Um, and those spaces can not feel great for a large swath of people, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, no matter kind of your gender identity. Um, yeah. So I'm glad to hear that it's not uh, that experience for you. And I definitely lucked out with this place because while finding work, I was like asking myself, am I going to find a place that's accepting to, you know, the way I express my gender or I'm just going to say, fuck it, I'm going to go get any job and I'm going to gender fuck that place. Like, (laughs) right. They're going to have to deal with it. And I mean, you can kind of say I did that here, but there was no need. Like, everyone was cool there. Um, everyone is, it's a very heartwarming, easygoing environment. So I think that, that has to do with it being just a small shop with like four of us or yeah. five. Mm-hmm. Was it, I mean, I can imagine if I was in your shoes, I would feel nervous like walking into the, into that space at first without knowing Um, Mm -hmm. what kind of space it was going to be and even like in the school environment I could I would imagine I would feel a little nervous about that environment as well Mm -hmm. how do you how do you dig down and find the just to be like like you said I'll just go in and like gender fuck this place like how do you find that (laughs) not funny like school it was just easy like I put on a dress showed up and it was like you know, you get some giggles mm-hmm. and, but most of the people loved it. Like they were like, oh, I love your dress. Um, school was easy. It was like, it's definitely a safe place for that kind of thing. You can mm-hmm. sort of say, aside from the jokes, you'll hear some people say as you're walking by, you know, however you choose to express it. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get mad over jokes. I'm not going to get mad over giggles. I did see a couple of death glares, which was a little worrisome. I'm like, yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I, I kind of catch me by surprise when I see a death glare. I'm like, okay, like, I understand, like, kind of seeing it is funny, but like, is there, is there a reason, like, you're angry right now? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so school was a pretty easy thing for me to get used to, you know, expressing myself. Mm -hmm. um, the wood shop, I didn't really give it, like, the one I'm working at right now, I didn't really give it any mind. I just sort of, walked in and I guess like it can be kind of kind of silly like there's only so much you can express in a wood shop like I'm yep. not yep. gonna go in there with flowy clothes yeah you know put myself in danger and no I just go in as I am like you know proper wood shop clothing right um but you know they get the idea of what I am and they don't have a problem with it Every, everyone there is relatable somehow mm -hmm. okay Awesome. Um, do you think you've opened some of their minds a little bit to like, do you think you're helping to pave the way for um, other gender expressions to, to walk in the door and them being even more like at ease? I would really hope so. Um, Aside from doing it for myself, like I really wanted to create a space like wherever I go and express myself where others can feel like they can do the same, you know, mm -hmm. you want to try and be yourself so much that everyone else feels comfortable being themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm not there right now to see any results, but I hope that, you know, there's some sort of feeling of that in the places I've been. As far as Instagram, like social media goes, I'm pretty straightforward and open about my yeah. gender identity. Most that's ever happened to me was getting getting some unfollows. And that's really it. But mm -hmm. you know, no, no trolling, no trolling, no hate mail. I mean, I I got one troll, which was like a friend from years back that was just surprised to see what I look like now. <laughs> but you know. They weren't doing it in like a super hateful manner. Yeah. Um, Instagram is is fine. Uh, I don't get any hate mail on there. Um, people are as far from what I've uh, witnessed, mm -hmm. at least from my followers or people that I follow. They're pretty accepting of the whole non-binary transgender thing. Um, Facebook is where I can definitely get a little yeah <laughs> um i had a family friend on there actually actually i might have been an aunt to be honest that for the longest of times i think <laughs> i think she might her facebook account might have gotten locked for it but she was posting the most atrocious things about non-binary people just constantly hating on them every single day and i'm like oh man how do I bring this up to her? Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, do I bring it up to her? I never even see her in person. So, you know, I don't, I don't think she's affecting me, but I'm just hearing the things that she says. And I'm like, no, this can't be real. Like every single day you're posting something about this. Yeah. Um, so I, like I said, you know, it's mostly through social media where I'll see a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Um especially with everything that's going on there's a lot of like yeah. transphobia like i'll be scrolling through posts that have nothing to do with gender identity and then somewhere in that comment section like people are saying yeah. or you know kind of referring to transgender non-binary people making poking fun at them which is a surprise to me like okay this has no relevance to that but you're somehow right <laughs> about it. anyways yeah that's my experience with it <laughs> yeah um i would say you're definitely not alone on facebook um mm -hmm. like i had i personally had to remove it uh it's probably been almost two years ago now, like remove the app from my phone just because mm -hmm. um, it, I, I have family members who would be posting stuff, um, especially like anti 
uh, queer stuff. And I was like, okay, like if I am to ever expect to be able to speak to you again, like in person, I need to not know these beliefs you have because I can't. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's I a really can't. tough thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People you love, people you thought were great end up yeah. saying these things. And you don't want to, or well, you don't want it to get in the way of, you know, loving the people you've loved, but it's tough to be around that for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, like you said, it affects mental health, right? Like it just does. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely. Yeah. I'm grateful that my, I'm grateful that my immediate family has no issues with things like that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my extended family has no issues with it. But, you know, there's a person here and there that you'll hear say. Yep. Hey, Makers, today's episode is sponsored in part by ToolMomStore.com. At ToolMomStore.com, you can find any and all tool-based merchandise for all genders, all sizes. They've got mugs, they've got shirts, all kinds of cool stuff. I have uh, one of the shirts myself that has the uh, hashtag woodworker on it. And I also have a couple of the mugs that define what and who is a tool chick. So super excited with the merchandise that I have. I know that you will be satisfied as well. Um, and also great discount for those of you who listen to the podcast at checkout. If you enter the code maker mom, you will get a 20% discount off any of the merchandise that you buy. So that's just toolmomstore.com. All right, let's head back into the action. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, do you kind of going back to the craft of, of carving and also talking about like furniture, do, have you been able to incorporate like carving into furniture pieces at all? I've really wanted to. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, being honest with furniture making, the stuff that I was doing in school, like whether it's box making, furniture making, like tool making, it was really tough to begin with because actually it was really tough to make the projects to begin with because I joined school right when COVID hit. Mm. So a lot of it was trying to do woodworking from home. Yeah. I can't really say I've incorporated carving into my furniture too much. Um, although going back to my current workplace, my boss has actually shown me a very interesting way of incorporating carving into furniture. It's a method that he uses called applique, Mm -hmm. where you'll see it a lot in, how do I say, like, I don't know if you've ever seen a fancy door with all the wood carvings on it. A lot of the way they do it or the way he's shown me that they do it is they actually make the door but then they carve out a separate piece separate piece and they attach it to the door like Mm -hmm. an applique method so it's basically layering different pieces of wood so I kind of wondered like how am I gonna make a piece of furniture and then just start chiseling into it right (laughs) so I learned a great method called applique, which I hope to take into my future work and find a way to incorporate wood carving into my furniture. Because mm-hmm. I've always told my teachers, like, I want to do that. But then I get to a point where I'm bar- barely even having time to finish a project. And, right. <laughs> okay. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to make the furniture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I already know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it. Which do you feel like you have more of a love for the the carving or furniture making? It's a tough one. I would say mostly a love for the sculptural part of it, which is the carving. Mm-hmm. You know, it's what I started with, what I kept, and I'm definitely going to keep the furniture. Mm-hmm. You know. You know, getting work in that, but 
as far as like my main thing what I do is carving mm-hmm. yeah um I mean I could I can envision some fun pieces in my head I'm just thinking like if you ever made a bed the post mm-hmm. could be characters that would be fun yeah um, I really want that <laughs> incorporated mm-hmm. yeah um do you have any desire or have you uh like try to submit some of your character sculptural work to galleries i'm hoping of doing that actually it did cross my mind recently i've been making a little series of japanese yokai characters where it's these japanese folklore beings whether it's you know supernatural demons or just creatures Mm -hmm. and i'm liking the way they're coming out i know there's a little museum in new mexico called i can't even remember the name but they have a yokai museum there Mm -hmm. which was a surprise to me you know somewhere in new mexico so i thought about potentially like submitting once that series is done submitting it to that museum or gallery as far as actual submission goes, the closest things I've submitted to something like that is for the Wingate Lamar Fellowship. So I recently did that in February. And, you know, some school galleries as well. But it's definitely something I want to do where I can display my work a little more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I mean, I see, I think um, the two pieces you talked about earlier, some of your recent ones, the, like the the nightmare one and um, mm-hmm. the other piece, like, I mean, they sound like pretty powerful pieces. So I feel like, you know, I think diving into more of that and having that be seen would be awesome Mm, i am hoping of diving more into it like making these pieces of the concept so Mm -hmm. this this series i'm definitely going to keep going with Mm -hmm. yeah with um like the japanese characters and you talked earlier too about some like native american um Mm -hmm. pieces what do you think draws you to those type of like those cultures? I would say the thing that drives me to both of them is two things, you know. There's the handwork where I see these people making things from scratch with just whatever they have access to, like these small tools. Mm -hmm whatever wood they can find kind of making beauty out of scarcity Mm -hmm. you know um that was a big thing for me and just the playfulness in their toys or whatever wood carvings they make you know the native americans hopi and navajo to my knowledge they made those gachinas these beautiful intricate things as toys for their kids you know they would give their kids these hopi um gachina spirits as dolls and toys which just thought was great and there's the japanese that would make those adorable little kokeshi dolls Mm -hmm. i just love the playfulness in those two things um I would say it's the beauty out of scarcity thing that catches me the most. Mm -hmm. It's just making what you can with your two hands and whatever space you have. Um, And I would definitely say that falls back on when I was first starting because, you know, I I live in a two bedroom apartment with 10 other people. So we're pretty crammed in there. You know, I would fluctuate from seven people in a two-bedroom apartment to 10 people to 11 people in a two-bedroom apartment. (laughs) I didn't have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. So 
my idea and I kind of got this concept from my brother was he had this idea that he wouldn't own more things that he than he can pack in a suitcase and take off. Um, I, I don't really like that mindset all the time, mm-hmm. but I kind of carried that, I think, unconsciously into my workspace, which is I want my entire studio to fit inside a toolbox so that anywhere I go is my studio. And that is, goes back to watching the Gachina Carvers. All they carve with is like these little tools. Well, not all of them, like, you know, you'll see some carve with like little knives and make these huge, beautiful sculptures. And I'm like, you know what? I could fit knives and gouges into a toolbox. Anywhere I go can be my studio. I don't have to worry about space. Yep. You know, I, I hope to have like a well-equipped studio at some point, but right now, you know, being able to fit all of that in a toolbox and going back to what I said earlier, making beauty out of scarcity is mm-hmm. what I'm doing at the moment. You know, work with whatever space I can. Mm-hmm. How do you, I mean, I think I think that's beautiful. I love that the finding beauty out of scarcity. And um, how do you feel like you share that message, like across like social media and across your work? So across social media. Um, you know, I do have discussions with other wood carvers of like what tools I use, or I will post videos on Instagram of me actually making the pieces. Mm-hmm. And I just show them that it's just with a few knives and some gouges. And I'll show them, I'll actually show them my toolbox where it just opens up and everything's in there that you need. So you know, I show some of my process and, you know, it's been flattering to have people ask me for advice on what's a good starting kit for wood carving. And I tell them just buy this knife, buy this small set of gouges, buy a strop and you're all set, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the advice I give to people who want to make small scale stuff, showing my process and showing them the tools that they need Mm -hmm. and I had another thing that I forgot but that's pretty much it you know just showing that you can make stuff with just small Mm -hmm. hand do you see yourself ever teaching this skill I have been drawn to the idea of it Mm -hmm. I feel like wood carving isn't really something that's taught you know when take sculpture class it's usually ceramics or you know taking the upcycled route and using whatever you know material you can find but notice there's never been really at least the schools that I've gone to like a more comprehensive take on wood carving Mm -hmm. So I've been drawn to the idea of actually showing people like just specifically like the art of like carving wood and making something out of it. I did have a student actually reach out to me on Facebook and said, I really hope that they have you as a guest speaker for our mallet project because we do this fun first project in woodworking where you make a croquet mallet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a wood carving project. So that's flattering to hear. And I told her, like, you know, I would definitely be up for that. I'd be up for showing some wood carving. So teaching has definitely crossed my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, right now that I graduated school, I'm just like, I'm not even thinking about school. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> that was an ordeal, to say yeah. the least. So school's not on my mind at the moment, but I'm I'm not completely shutting the door on that Mm -hmm. you know I would love to go back maybe someday and with more experience gathering shit for an MFA 
and have the ability to teach. Yeah, well, if it makes you feel any better, because I understand that sentiment completely. Um, you know, I graduated with my bachelor's and I was like, what, 22? And now I'm 40 <laughs> and I'm going back to school to get my MFA. So um, I think I finally got to a point where it's like, I have enough distance that it's not as nightmarish as <laughs> like it would have been <laughs> going yeah. straight after uh, my bachelor's. But um I would say you have plenty of time to get there, but I could imagine that seeing your work like on Instagram and stuff, like I think people would be very interested in just like how you break it down, especially like you said, like watching the video tutorials you did to get started mm -hmm. and it didn't really resonate with you, those processes. I'm sure there's other people out there that feel the same, that mm -hmm. might resonate with like your individual process. Mm -hmm. I feel that, um, you know, some people do watch those videos and say like, you know what, I was going to get into wood carving, but it just seems kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell no. Like <laughs> there is something wrong with tutorials right now. Like that's why I just stopped watching them. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I learned some basics off of them, but I got tired of drawing onto the piece of wood and then just trying to carve around my drawing. I'm like, no, let's just mm -hmm. start doing the potato peeling, just hack away at it. Yep. So yeah, if I if if people see value in the way I make it, you know, I'd be more than willing to teach it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um I mean, even without going and, and getting an MFA, you always have options to, to teach in the sense of, um, you know, on teaching platforms, like mm -hmm. you'll share and stuff like that. Um, they do give you options to be able to get your, your take on it um, out there. What was it called? Skillshare. Skillshare? Yeah. Um, and I think because I was just checking it out um, to post some of my stuff on there, it looks like you can post for free. So it's not like you have to pay um, like a fee to get your mm -hmm. your classes put up there. Um, but it also then allows you to like make some money off of mm -hmm. uh, teaching, which is always nice. You put in the work once and then, you know continue to get people to buy it without having to do any more work on it, which is <laughs> pretty cool. ideal situation for me anyways. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look into that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm watching our time and we are getting close to the end of our time. And so I want to give you a chance to let people know like how they can follow along with you and find your very cool carvings. Um, to obsess over like I do now. <laughs> so you can find my work mostly on Instagram. It is Crooked Craft Work. It's all one word. Mm -hmm. And it doubles as my making profile and my personal profile. But <laughs> honestly, that's the only thing that yeah. ever on my mind is making. So that's mostly what you'll see. So <laughs> you'll find all of my work on there, you know, feel free to shoot me a message, contact me, and, you know, we'll just nerd out on making stuff. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so Cricket <laughs> Craft Work Instagram. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I'll include the link uh, for that in the show notes, too, to make it uh, a little easier, um, just in case. And um, I really uh, appreciate chatting with you today and learning a little bit more about your process. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. All right, so again, that was Rogelio Rendon um, of Crooked Craftworks, and I will include the links on how you can follow along with them in the show notes. Best place to find those show notes is first check the description on your podcast app for the episode. Or if you're watching this on the Freeman Furnishings YouTube channel, check the description box down below. And lastly, you can head on over to freemanfurnishings.com forward slash podcast. And uh, get this episode's show notes as well as all the past episodes. 
Be sure to follow along with the podcast over on Instagram at Crafting Revolution. And that's actually the best way uh, to find the ways to support the podcast as well. So at Crafting a Revolution on Instagram, link in the bio, there's an option to go to Patreon, which would give you uh, the chance to support in an ongoing monthly basis uh, with several different tier options. There is a link to take you to just do a one-time donation. Um, and then otherwise, if you would still like to support the podcast, uh, but not in a monetary way, please share about the podcast, head over to iTunes, especially, and leave a review. Make sure that you like and subscribe on all of your podcast platforms. All of that helps get more eyes and ears on the podcast and helps it grow. So that is very much needed and wanted and appreciated. While you're over there on Instagram following along with the podcast, make sure to uh, come over and say hi to your two hosts as well. So you can find me, Katie Freeman, at Freeman Furnishings on Instagram, TikTok as well. And you can find Katie Thompson um, at Women of Woodworking and at Pen and Chisel. Both of those are her uh, big uh, passion projects around woodworking and um, diversifying the field of woodworking. So come on over and say hi again uh, at Freeman Furnishings for myself and at Women of Woodworking uh, for Katie Thompson. All right, we will be back next week with two brand new episodes. And in the meantime, as always, let's go craft a revolution. She, her, fan, they got something they want to say. Solution